Hello, welcome to Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Weldon. This week, we are presenting part one of a serial novel called The Brilliant Firefly, an original work by Daniel Hines. Over the next few weeks, we'll be presenting all of book one, Reborn. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. The Brilliant Firefly, Reborn. Chapter one, Giga City Blues. Jillian Jays was sitting quietly at her desk, running through her judo meditations, when the 200-foot-tall robot ripped out her bedroom wall with a deafening crash. She looked up, all tranquility forgotten, and found herself staring into a trio of mechanical eyes, reflecting the bright reds and blues of the police cars hundreds of feet below. And Mom said they'd be safe on the 20th floor of the apartment building. Yeah, right. Jill threw herself backwards from her desk with a yelp and rolled towards the far wall. The machine's arm continued its destructive path, ripping out another hundred feet of building and sending it raining into the crowds below. Even over the smashing and the sirens, Jill could hear the terrified screams. A second later, the screams turned to cheers. A red blur flew in at blinding speed and smashed into the chest of the machine, sending it staggering away from the apartment tower. The blur hit it again and again, driving the robot backward, slowly but surely pushing it towards the Great Lee suspension bridge that spanned the bay. The bedroom door flung wide and her mom rushed in, still wearing her scrubs. She gave a scream when she saw the gaping hole where the wall once stood, now nothing but empty air and a long drop to the ground. Jilly? Jilly? Mom, I'm okay, said Jill, walking back over and sitting at her desk again. Professor Gizmo's dumb robot just knocked out my wall. Oh, thank God. She wrapped Jill in a tight hug and then sat on the desk, reaching out of habit to smooth her daughter's perpetually messy hair. Jill shook off her hand with a scowl. Don't touch my hair. You used to love it. Yeah, when I was nine. Mom heaved a sigh, turning to stare at the battle raging through the city. I swear, this city, she said. This robot has been rampaging for hours now. When will they do something about it? Looks like the Crimson Cannonball is dealing with it now, said Jill. But even as the words left her mouth, the robot's chest cannons caught the red blur in midair and sent it cartwheeling into the cool waters of the bay. Or maybe not. If only Firefly was still around, Mom said wistfully. I remember a time when the Scarlet King's mutant land shark came rampaging out of the bay. It was at least twice as big as this robot. Well, Firefly had it taken care of in under an hour. I had tickets to a play that night, and I didn't even miss the opening number. Mother and daughter both gazed out of the ruined wall, still dripping cement and rebar, as the crimson cannonball was fished out of the bay by two other equally beat-up-looking heroes. "'Who are they?' said Mom, squinting. "'Is that the Tower Twins?' "'It looks like Riptide and Captain Legend, Mom,' said Jill. "'You really should wear your glasses.' "'Oh, hush! Look, here they go!' Riptide helped the other two heroes to shore and then summoned up a series of mighty waves with his magic trident. They surged forward and crashed against the robot's mechanical legs, causing it to stagger backward. At the same time, the crimson cannonball flew Captain Legend up and up and dropped him into the machine's antenna-covered head. The captain landed, rolled, and then pulled something out of his cape-like trench coat and slapped it down. He jumped a second later falling a hundred feet in the time it takes to draw breath before being caught and whisked away by the crimson cannonball. After a heartbeat's pause, there was a crunching boom and a red flower of fire erupted on the robot's head. The machine spun lazily in circles until the crimson cannonball, having dropped Captain Legend safely on the ground, once more crashed into its chest. This time, the bot went over, beeping and grinding wildly as it tripped over the lee bridge and smashed into the cold waters of the bay. Jill and her mother watched as the robot tried to sit up again, but water came pouring from the joint of its mechanical neck and it splashed back down, the lights and noise fading away, water washing over it in surging, bubbling waves. Well, said Mom after a moment, I guess this is as good a time as any to tell you. We're moving to Grandpa Jack's. 
out in the country. Jill was sure she didn't hear that right. Grandpa's? But there's nothing to do there. Nothing ever happens there. Exactly, her mother said, suddenly angry. Look at this, she said, gesturing to the gaping hole in the side of their apartment building. This isn't any place to grow up. It's too dangerous. The villains are getting stronger and the heroes are getting weaker. Riptide, Crimson Cannonball, Captain Legend, they aren't fit to scrub Firefly's jets. Never mind protect the city. Look at what happened to your poor father. Don't talk about him. And if that isn't enough, I find out that you haven't been to school in two weeks. Two weeks, Jillian. Jill blushed, furious, but caught again. She started to stutter out a reply, but her mother wasn't through. Not by a long shot. I can't keep you in school. All you want to do is your judo and run around with losers. You used to be so bright, Jilly. What happened? Jill shrugged. Learning didn't seem to matter much when the school and every other building in town was constantly being destroyed by supervillains. Try telling that to mom, though, and you'd just end up fighting for an hour and grounded for a week. Well, mom continued on, I think a change of scenery will do you good, and it's not up for debate. Jill felt the familiar fire flicker inside of her. It was the anger. The same anger she used to fuel her judo fights. The same anger she had used to kick down the detention room door the time the principal had tried to lock her in. Jill thought of it as her matchstick anger, because it started shaky and small like a single match, and a gentle word could snuff it. But if she fed it, just a little, it would flare up, big and bright. And dangerous. That, too. School is a waste! With everything that's going on, who cares about math or science or grammar? I'm learning judo, and when I'm older, I'll be able to fight. I'll be able to fight and protect us until the real heroes come back. Jill waited for her mother to rage back at her, but, for once, Mom just looked sad. I'm sorry, Jilly, but the real heroes are gone. They're not coming back to Giga City. They're never coming back. She paused, giving Jill's shoulders a squeeze. And neither are we. Chapter 2. To Grandpa's House We Go Mom, are we there yet? Mom just turned and glared at her, ending the conversation before it started. Jill was sprawled out in the back seat of their SUV, a paperback book forgotten in her lap, a sulky expression on her face. Do they at least have judo out here? Sensei Ocasio said I was almost ready for my black belt. Her mother frowned. Jilly, I'm sorry, but there aren't any judo teachers out here. I checked. Jill just sighed and draped her paperback over her face dramatically. You better order me a coffin, Mom, because I'll be bored to death within the week. Outside the car windows, the world had changed slowly. It was, Jill thought to herself, like traveling in a time machine. The skyscrapers of the city got smaller and smaller, and once they crossed over the last of the Bay Bridges, had disappeared entirely. As they drove into the countryside, the buildings continued to shrink, metal and glass turning into dusty red clapboards, eventually giving way completely to farmhouses and long, impossibly boring stretches of cornfields. Jill must have fallen asleep at some point, because next thing she knew, she was being lifted bodily out of the car and spun through the air. My little jelly bean, look at you, you're almost as tall as me. It was her Grandpa Jack, as sturdy as she remembered him. Short and lantern-jawed, his hair a machine-steel gray. He set her dizzily on her feet and caught her mother in a rough bear hug. And my Anne, even prettier than the last time you visited, which was what, three years ago? Jill's mother gave Grandpa Jack a kiss on the cheek and playfully pushed him away. Well, maybe we'd have visited you more if you stayed in the city. Whatever in the world made you want to retire to farm country? You're an engineer, and you never even liked the outdoors. For the peace and quiet, said Grandpa Jack, a sad smile briefly dancing across his lips. Besides, you're one to talk, moving out here in a huff just because of a little 200-foot-tall killer robot attack. When you were a little girl, I never knew you to be afraid of a little supervillainry. As you may have noticed sometime in the past 30 years, I'm not a little girl anymore, 
said Mom as she pulled their luggage out of the SUV and piled it in Grandpa's dirt driveway. In fact, I have a little girl of my own, and her school has been blown up, crushed, frozen solid, and even turned into stone. And that's all just this past semester. The city's not so safe as it once was, not since we lost Firefly. These new heroes try, but there's only so much B-listers like Magmam and Wingman can do when the Professor Gizmo or the Harpy come calling. Grandpa Jack picked up the bags and started towards his squat little farmhouse. From around the back, Jill could hear the assorted moos and whinnies of farm animals, but she was more worried about her cell phone, which was currently getting no reception. Grandpa, what's your Wi-Fi network? she asked. Is it private? My phone isn't picking anything up. Grandpa laughed as he climbed the steps to his porch and banged open a front door that had half its paint worn off. Sorry, honey, Grandpa said. No Wi-Fi out here. No real reception, either. Got me an old dial-up modem in the back room if you need to check your electronic mail or something. Jill froze, her jaw dropping. Mom, tell me he isn't serious. Jilly, I'm sure there's plenty of fun things to do here without the internet, right, Dad? Tell her about all the fun things there are to do here. Yup, plenty to do, said Grandpa, leading the way into the little farmhouse. There's the cows to milk, the sheep to shear, gotta get the eggs from the chickens. The inside of the house was, to Jill's horror, exactly what she had expected. Cozy, handmade wooden furniture, a tight little kitchen, a narrow staircase leading upstairs to the bedrooms, and not a television to be found. Don't you worry about being bored, though, little lady. Tomorrow I'm going to paint the barn and then we can watch it dry. Grandpa said, shooting his daughter a wink. And let me tell you, won't that be a time? I'll be in my room, said Jill, slinging her duffel bag over her shoulder and starting up the steps. First door on the left, Grandpa said, trying to stifle a laugh. Be nice, Dad, Jill heard her mom's voice drifting up the stairs behind her. This move is hard for her and teasing isn't going to make it any easier. Ah, shucks, she'll be all right. The coachmans live not a mile down the road, have a daughter her age. I'll introduce him tomorrow. Jill found her room and closed the door behind her, cutting off the voices. The room was small, built under the eaves so half the ceiling sloped down and made it feel even smaller. Grandpa had set it up with a narrow bed and a little desk, barely big enough for her laptop. Well, thought Jill, at least there's a window. But when she looked out of the dusty glass, she could see nothing but unmoving cornfields stretching in orderly rows into the twilight horizon. Awesome, she thought sarcastically, slinging her duffel bag onto the bed. She unzipped it and began to pull out items. Her clothes were in the bigger suitcases downstairs, but everything that really mattered was in this bag. She pulled out her laptop and set it on the little desk. Without internet, there wasn't much point in turning it on. She couldn't even watch Netflix. Next, she pulled out her smartphone charger, another piece of useless machinery. Under that was her judo belt. It was brown, only one step away from the black belt she had been working on, but with no sensei in this area, it looked like brown was as far as she'd get. She wadded the belt into a ball and threw it into a corner. Under the belt was a small black tool, scarred and scuffed from years of hard use. It looked like a flat rectangle until Jill picked it and pulled from either side, and then it unfolded down the middle and flipped open, revealing a multi-tool bristling with different items. It was her father's design, the one tool he used every single day, and Jill could still remember how she loved to watch him open it. It unfolded like a secret, like a flower in the dawning hours of spring, like potential energy being realized. When she was finally old enough to use it, she loved to sneak it from the pouch on his belt and carry it up to her room. He would always steal it back from her, never mentioning it. Jill lifted the tool in her hand and held it to her heart. Dad, I don't want to live here. I want to go home. Outside, a gentle breeze sighed through the corn, giving a faint rustle that almost could have been a whisper. Jill listened hard, trying to pick up the signal in the noise tears slipping down her cheeks. She was still trying when she dropped off into a dark and troubled sleep. 
To be continued. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.